Hello, and welcome to our training program for the globally harmonized system of chemical hazards, labels, and safety data sheets. My name is David Halton, and I wrote and prepared this training program to help us understand the hazards of chemicals and how to work safely with them. The globally harmonized system, or GHS, as it's called for short, is a way to communicate chemical hazard information, and it has been adopted all over the world. This means that wherever we go, the symbols we see to denote chemical hazards are the same in Europe as they are in the Americas, Asia, Australasia, and Africa. It's a huge advance over the chemical hazard communication systems we used in the past. And perhaps that's where we need to start our program, by looking at what we had in the past and understanding why we needed to harmonize globally. But first, let's look at the roadmap for the entire training program and see the ground we're going to cover. There are 10 short sections to this program. Some last 15 minutes and some only last five. And it's better to take the program two or three sections at a time rather than all at once. Here is what each section is going to be about. We begin by asking in section one, why do we actually need a chemical hazard information system at all? Then in sections two, three, and four, we're going to explain about the three different hazard groups used in the globally harmonized system. In sections five, six, and seven, we're going to give examples of how we can prevent hazards from happening. In section eight, nine, and 10, we're going to see what GHS labels and safety data sheets look like and how to use them. Did I say safety data sheets? Ah. That's what some countries used to call material safety data sheets, or MSDSs. The GHS just calls them safety data sheets, or SDSs. So let's start with a look at where all this began and ask ourselves, why is it that we need a hazard communication and information system at all? The answer is quite simply that while chemicals are used to benefit our lives in many ways, some of them are dangerous. And if we're going to use them, we need to know how to use them safely. Safe use is important for people in manufacturing industries, in transportation, for emergency responders such as firefighters and police, and last but certainly not least for consumers who buy cleaners, glues, and paint thinners for use around the house. To work safely with a chemical product, we need to know three main things. What's in it? In other words, what are its ingredients? What are the hazards of those ingredients? And what can we do to prevent the hazards from happening? Now, you'd think it'd be fairly easy to get that information, but in the past it wasn't. And we'll find out why in section one. And when we finish section one, we'll be able to describe why managers and workers could not always get chemical hazard information, We'll be able to explain why this was a problem for employers in industries using chemicals. We'll be able to list the three main parts of the solution adopted in many countries. We'll be able to list three reasons why we needed a globally harmonized system. And we'll be able to name the three main hazard groups in the GHS. Before hazard communication systems existed, workers and managers often had trouble finding information on chemical products and their hazards. Sometimes it was because the chemical was newly synthesized and little or no information existed, and sometimes the manufacturer did not wish to disclose the details because it was a trade secret. This meant there was a gap in the information people needed to work safely. Now this was a problem because employers have a legal obligation to ensure their staff work safely, but without the information on chemical hazards, they could not meet these legal requirements. It was a ridiculous situation to be in. So governments in industrialized countries, often with the help of labor and industry, introduced systems to ensure safety information was available for people packaging and using hazardous chemicals. In most countries, the hazard information system consisted of three parts. Labels on the drums and packages of hazardous materials. Safety data sheet summaries about the hazards and how to prevent them from happening. And finally, 
training for people working with hazardous chemicals. Now, this was all well and good, except that each and every country developed its own unique supplier label system. And if this wasn't complicated enough, each country had a different hazard warning system for household consumer chemicals. And frequently, the hazard communication systems used for workplace and consumer products differed from that used for the worldwide transportation of dangerous goods. The result was a maze of different signs and symbols and requirements, not just from country to country, but within each country as well. Add to that, there were many countries in the world that didn't have any chemical hazard communication system at all. All these different information systems were a huge and expensive barrier to trade, and worse than that, the differences from country to country probably compromised safety. We just couldn't be sure that what was considered flammable or toxic in France was also considered to be so in China or New Zealand, because different countries used different standards to determine what was hazardous. What a mess! Didn't anybody think to sort it out? Well, actually they did, for many years. But it wasn't until 1992 that progress was made. In that year, the United Nations held a conference on environment and development in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. At that conference, which became known as the Earth Summit, it was agreed that the world needed a single unified approach to classifying chemical hazards. In addition, the methods of communicating these hazards by labels and safety data sheets should be the same from country to country and within each country. We needed a globally harmonized system to enhance international trade, improve chemical safety, and encourage countries with no hazard communication system to adopt the GHS right off the shelf. So how does the GHS work? Slide 9 explains the main features. All countries in the world are using, or will soon be using, the same standards to decide what is hazardous, so that what is considered flammable in Canada, the United States and Mexico, will also be considered flammable in Chile, Brazil, Argentina, all of Europe, Russia, Australia, India and so on, around the globe. Having established the same standards, these countries will use the same hazard symbol, or pictogram, to denote the hazard. For example, no matter where we are in the world, a flammable chemical will always be denoted by a flame. Next, to make sure it is easy for people to find hazard information, there are specific details that have to go on a label and in a safety data sheet. And finally, although the GHS is an agreement between countries and not a regulation, each country will most likely enact laws and regulations to make sure that chemical suppliers, employers and employees do their part to make the system work. And on that subject, here is what each of the parties must do, and I emphasize that these are generalizations. But in most countries adopting the GHS, the requirements on the workplace parties are similar. For example, in most countries, the chemical supplier or manufacturer must classify hazardous materials using GHS standards, label all materials shipped using the GHS label requirements, provide GHS compliant safety data sheets to customers. In most countries, employers have to label containers and packaging of hazardous materials used in the workplace, provide safety data sheets from the chemical supplier to employees, provide training for employees so they understand the GHS and how to use it. For their part, employees, both workers and managers, will be expected to take GHS training and use the information to work safely. So what exactly is required by law? Most countries have regulated requirements for labels, safety data sheets, and training. Some countries go even further and require an inventory of all hazardous materials as well as a written hazard information or communication program. Even if these last two items are not required in your country, they are really useful to have. So let's just backtrack a minute because we've been talking about a system to help us understand the hazards of chemicals and how to work safely with them. But in the GHS, 
What exactly is a hazardous chemical? Well, quite simply, a hazardous chemical is one that can cause harm to people and or the environment. The GHS is the first line of defense to prevent that harm. There are three main chemical hazard groups used in the GHS. They are called physical, health, and environmental. Physical hazards are usually materials that are flammable and reactive. Health hazards are materials which can harm human health. And environmental hazards are chemicals that can harm aquatic life, that's life that lives in water, or chemicals that can damage the ozone layer in the Earth's atmosphere. Well, that ends section one. So let's just very briefly go over the points made. We needed a globally harmonized system because countries were all using different systems, it was expensive for industry, confusing for people, and some countries didn't have any system at all. The idea of a globally harmonized system took off at the UN Conference on Environment and Development, the Earth Summit, in Rio in 1992. All the workplace parties, the chemical suppliers and manufacturers, the employers, and the staff have to do something to make the GHS work. The three main hazard groups in the GHS are physical hazards, health hazards, and environmental hazards. If you're viewing this program online, a quiz will pop up on the screen for you. If you're watching this on a DVD, it should be accompanied by a student notebook that has a short quiz at the end of each section. If you're taking this as part of a class, always work in twos and threes to answer the quiz questions. It's much more enjoyable that way. Besides, if you don't know the answer, you can just copy from your neighbor. And if they don't know the answer, you can flip to the back of the student notebook. That's where the answers are. The purpose of the quiz is to have some fun and make sure you know and understand the information. It's not there to see if you can score an A. Have a go at the quiz and I'll see you back in section two. Welcome back. We're about to start section two. In the next three sections, we're going to have a look at the three hazard groups used in the globally harmonized system. Those are, you'll remember, physical, health, and environmental. And when we finish section two, we'll be able to explain the kind of harm caused by a physical hazard, name five broad classes of physical hazard, describe the hazards of explosive and flammable chemicals, describe the hazards of corrosive chemicals, describe the hazards of oxidizing chemicals, and describe the hazards of gases under pressure. Chemicals with physical hazards can cause damage and harm to people, property, and process. Physical hazards are amongst the most devastating of all the three hazard groups. A fire or explosion can cost lives and can shut down a plant forever, causing extensive job losses and ruination of a local economy. So it's really important to know about physical hazards. There are five broad types of physical hazards. Physical hazards include gases under pressure, explosives, corrosives, flammable chemicals, and oxidizers. We can remember the five main physical hazards by using the word PECFO, which stands for pressure, that's gases under pressure, E for explosives, C for corrosives, F for flammable, and O for oxidizers. Let's look at these five different types, each one in turn. Let's begin with perhaps the most dangerous, explosives. An explosion is the sudden and violent burning of a chemical, often a powder or a vapor. Explosive chemicals are extremely dangerous and require extra special care in the way they're used, stored, and handled. In the GHS, explosives include materials like dynamite, TNT, and gunpowder used for blasting, munitions, and fireworks. However, there are some materials which are not used as explosives, but nonetheless have the ability to explode if the right conditions exist. These materials are usually oxidizing or extremely flammable liquids and vapors, which in the presence of oxygen and a source of ignition can explode. 
The conditions needed for this to happen are often referred to as the fire triangle. As shown in slide 20, we need a source of fuel, a source of oxygen, and a source of ignition. For ignition to occur, the fuel must vaporize into the air and accumulate above a certain concentration known as the lower explosive limit, or the LEL. Gasoline, or petrol as some of us call it, has an LEL of 1.4%. This means gasoline vapors have to be present in the air above 1.4% before they will ignite. Once just above the LEL, and in the presence of oxygen, a spark or flame will ignite the vapors and cause an explosion. Our standard combustion engine in a car uses the fire triangle to cause controlled explosions. Fuel in the form of petrol or gasoline is vaporized into the cylinders and mixed with oxygen in the air before being ignited with a spark from the spark plugs. If the fuel-oxygen mixture is not rich enough, i.e. it's below the LEL, our car will fail to start. Our concern in the workplace is not with controlled explosions like those we use to power our cars, but with uncontrolled explosions that happen by accident. So, if we're using flammable materials, we should always make sure the three parts of the fire triangle are not present. We should check there are no sources of ignition, and that there's plenty of exhaust ventilation to keep vapor concentrations low. Unfortunately, Three parts of the fire triangle can occur in the most seemingly harmless situations. For example, in slide 21 we see a flammable chemical being drained from a large drum into a smaller bucket. There doesn't seem to be an ignition source here, so we might believe there's no possibility of a fire or explosion. But are we ever wrong? It just so happens that as the flammable liquid drains, a static charge can build up between the drum and the bucket. If a static spark jumps between one and the other, the vapors can ignite, causing a fireball explosion. There are many cases where this kind of situation has been horribly fatal. To avoid static buildup when transferring flammable liquids, we must bond and ground containers. Grounding is also called earthing in some parts of the English-speaking world. So whenever we're uncertain about how to do a job at work, we should always ask our supervisor or safety professional. Slide 22 shows how to prevent a spark from jumping from one container to another by using grounding and bonding. Grounding consists of running a conductive metal strip or wire from the large drum to the ground as shown by the red line on the left side in our slide. This enables any static charges from the drum to leak harmlessly to earth. Bonding consists of joining the smaller container to the main drum with a flexible conductive cable. Any charge building up in the small container can then escape to ground via the large drum and the grounding conductor. Our slide shows a special transfer pump being used. It is a really good idea to use special equipment for this kind of operation. So check out what the procedures are in your workplace. There is a difference between flammable and combustible chemicals. Flammable chemicals are those which can catch fire easily. Sometimes, just a spark from a steel-capped boot is enough to cause the vapors to burst into flames. Combustible chemicals, on the other hand, are those materials which burn, but usually need a period of sustained heating before they catch fire. It follows, then, that flammable chemicals are more hazardous than combustible ones, and if ever we are given the choice to use a combustible chemical instead of a flammable one, we should go for it. Vapors from flammable chemicals can be very devious. We can't see them. Even at room temperature, they can evaporate from an open drum and, because many of them are heavier than air, they sink to the floor. 
It's been known for vapors from flammable chemicals to travel from the top floor of a building down staircases and into the basement where they make contact with a boiler pilot light or with a welding torch. The vapor trail then catches fire and flashes back to the source which explodes. Let's move on to oxidizing chemicals. These are unusual in that they carry within them two parts of the fire triangle. If we take an oxidizer and put it in contact with a working surface or mix it with some other material, it reacts, generating its own heat and its own oxygen. All it needs is the fuel to complete the fire triangle and often that is provided by the material it is touching. So oxidizing chemicals can cause other materials to burst into flames. On to corrosive materials. These are easy to understand. They are usually acids or caustics, which when they contact surfaces will eat away at them. If they contact your clothing, they'll eat away at that too. And if they touch your skin, they may cause painful chemical burns. Finally, let's consider gases under pressure. Gases can be kept under pressure in cylinders. Sometimes the pressure is so great that the gas in the cylinder becomes a liquid. Containers of gases should always be handled and stored safely. They should never be heated. Cylinders like the one on the right should always be chained securely to a wall or a post so they won't fall over. Compressed gases can be toxic or flammable depending on their nature, so even a slight leak of a toxic or flammable gas into a small area can be extremely hazardous. Now the weakest point of a compressed gas cylinder is at its top, where the valve is installed, which is why we have to chain them securely to a wall, because if the cylinder falls over, the valve at the top can snap off, and if it does, run for cover. The cylinder will take off like a rocket and we don't want to be near it. The pressure inside is released very suddenly and we have a huge cylinder flying around the room, rather like a balloon would when we blow it up and let it go. This phenomenon is known as rocketing and cylinders that rocket can penetrate through solid walls and zigzag dangerously causing havoc and extensive damage before coming to rest. Let's sum up what we covered in section two. Physical hazards are those that can cause damage to people, property, and process. There are five broad types of physical hazards that can be remembered using the word PECFO. P for gases under pressure, E for explosive, C for corrosive, F for flammable, and O for oxidizing. For flammable and explosive materials, the three parts of the fire triangle have to be present. A source of ignition, some fuel, and a source of oxygen. Oxidizing materials have two of the three fire triangle parts all by themselves. They generate heat and they generate oxygen when in contact with other materials. Corrosive materials will eat away at other materials they touch, including your skin. Gases under pressure must be used, handled, and stored securely in cool dry places so they don't leak, don't explode, and don't rocket. Have a look at the questions in your quiz, share your answers with your friends, and have some fun. I'll see you back in section three. Hello again. In section three, we'll find out the different types of health effects chemicals can cause. This is a really fascinating section of the program because there's a huge amount of concern and unfortunately some misinformation about how chemicals can cause health effects. Let's see if we can't sort it out and put it in plain, understandable language. When we finish section three, we'll be able to describe the kind of harm caused by a health hazard, give an example of a local health effect, give an example of a systemic, that's poisoning effect, list two types of poisoning, and explain what makes chemicals poisonous. So what are health hazards? Well, put quite simply, chemicals with health hazards can damage human health. That damage can be temporary or permanent. It can also be local, such as a skin rash, or it can be more serious, such as poisoning. Local effects are those that happen at the site where the chemical contacts the body. For example, chemical skin burns caused by corrosives such as acids and caustics. 
or eye irritation caused by strong vapors. Poisoning, on the other hand, happens when chemicals enter the body. Examples of the symptoms of poisoning might include headache and dizziness. There are all kinds of local effects, such as defatting. Some organic solvents like white spirit, varsol or paint thinners extract the natural oils and fats from the skin, leaving it dry, cracked and scaly. Some chemicals are allergens and can cause hives and itchy rashes. Corrosive materials can actually burn the skin. Vapors and gases with strong odors can really irritate the nose and throat. Let's now consider poisoning. There are two main types of poisoning. The first and most common type is called acute poisoning, and it happens when we are exposed to too much of a chemical all at one time. To make this more understandable, instead of using workplace chemicals as an example, let's use the sun. If we go on a vacation and lie out on the beach the first day, we can get serious sunburn, heat exhaustion, and even life-threatening heat stroke. All of these effects are examples of acute poisoning from the sun. The other type of poisoning, which is less common, is called chronic poisoning. It happens when we're exposed to something day after day in relatively small amounts so that no acute effects are noticed. However, after many years of being exposed, a health effect will occur. This is rather like going on the beach day after day for many months or years without wearing any sunblock or skin protection. It's possible that with repeated day after day exposure to the harmful rays of the sun, we get skin cancer. Skin cancer is a consequence of chronic poisoning from the sun. So exposure to the sun provides a good example of what we mean by acute and chronic effects. Many chemicals we use in the workplace have acute and chronic health effects and some have both. Now before we get carried away with worrying about the health effects of chemicals, it's really important to understand that the entire physical world is made of chemicals. So the food we eat is made of chemicals, the buildings we live in and work in are made of chemicals, everything in nature is chemical, and all chemicals, whether they are natural or made by people, can cause acute poisoning, if we are exposed to too much at one time. So what do we mean by this? Oh, well, in slide 35, we have three different chemicals. Antibiotics from the doctor, a glass of our favorite alcoholic brew, and a tumbler of water. We use antibiotics to poison germs that are infecting us. Antibiotics are strong poisons. We understand that if we take two pills a day for two weeks as the doctor prescribed, then we're going to be cured. Hmm. Well, let's suppose we don't want to take two weeks to get better. We only want to take a week. So, theoretically, if we doubled the dose and took four pills a day instead of two, maybe we could get better twice as fast. The trouble is that if we do this, we cross a threshold. Two pills a day will poison and kill the bacteria without harming us. However, four pills a day will not only poison the infecting bacteria, it may well poison us too. So here's an important point to remember. It's the dose or the amount of a chemical that we take into us that determines whether or not it is harmful. The dose makes the poison. Let's take another example on the slide. Our favorite brew. Alcohol is a moderate poison. If we only drink just a little, it has a pleasant effect on us. It helps us relax. Unless, of course, we drink too much, whereupon it starts to poison us and makes us feel awful. Uh, so much so that we swear we'll never touch another drop. So here again, the dose or the amount determines whether or not the alcohol is poisonous. Let's look at the last example on the slide. Water. Ha, ah, but that's not a poison, is it? Well, yes, it can be, if we take enough of it. 
And because water is only a weak poison, we have to drink an awful lot at one time for it to cause a bad health effect. Nevertheless, there are many well-documented cases of people who drank so much water they disturbed the natural salt balance in their bodies. In some cases, this happened to such a degree it was fatal. Remember, the dose or the amount of something determines if it will poison us or not. But just as in our slide, different chemicals we work with have different poisoning strengths, and we need to know which chemicals are strong poisons and which are weak. In our previous slide, antibiotics are strong poisons, alcohol is a moderate poison, and water is a very weak poison. So how can we tell which chemicals we work with are strong and which are weak poisons? To find this out, scientists use tests known as the lethal dose 50 and lethal concentration 50. The 50 stands for 50% or one half. In a lethal dose test, or LD50 test, animals are made to swallow various concentrations of a chemical. The dose of that chemical that kills 50% or one half of the test animals is known as the LD50, and it is a measure of how poisonous the chemical is. A very small LD50 means the chemical is very poisonous. A very large LD50 suggests the chemical is much less poisonous. The LD50 is perhaps not the best method of judging the poisoning strength of chemicals we use in the workplace, because in the workplace, we're not usually eating the chemicals like the test animals. What we are doing is breathing them in, and that is why the lethal concentration 50 test, or LC50 test, is probably more appropriate. In this particular test, vapors are sent into a container of test animals and the concentration which kills one half of those animals is known as the lethal concentration 50%, LC50. A very small LC50 means the chemical is very poisonous. This slide shows us how the globally harmonized system classifies acutely toxic chemicals. The column on the left indicates the route by which the chemical is given to the animals, i.e. by mouth, or on the skin, or inhaled. The column next to it indicates the LD or LC50 of the chemicals which are most toxic. The columns on the right of the slide indicate the LD values for chemicals that are much less toxic. And in the last column on the right, it requires so much chemical to cause poisoning that many regulatory authorities don't consider these as serious hazards. So to summarize our points from section three, chemicals with health hazards can damage human health. The damage can be temporary or it can be permanent. It can be a local effect such as a skin rash or it can be something more serious such as poisoning. There are two types of poisoning. Acute, which happens when we're exposed to too much of something all at once, and chronic, which happens when we're exposed to just a little bit of something day after day for many months or years. Any chemical at all, including water, can cause acute poisoning if we have too much of it at one time. What we have to do is to find out which chemicals are strong poisons and which are weak, we can do this by looking at the lethal dose 50 or lethal concentration 50 from animal testing. A small LD or LC50 means the chemical is very poisonous. See how you do with the questions on section three. See you when you're ready for section four. Ah, there you are again. You're just in time for section four where we're very quickly going to finish up our description of the three main hazard groups in the GHS. We've done physical hazards, we've done health hazards, and now we're going to do environmental hazards. When we finish section four, we'll be able to describe the kind of harm caused by an environmental hazard, name the parts of the environment of concern for the GHS, name a management approach that can prevent physical health and environmental hazards from happening, and list two advantages of a SHE management system.
Under the GHS, environmental hazards are those which can harm the water, the aquatic environment, and those which can damage and deplete the ozone layer in the atmosphere around the Earth. Now it's possible that in future years the GHS will select other types of environmental hazard, such as those in urban air or soil, but for the present time it only focuses on the aquatic environment and the ozone layer. Aquatic life can be damaged if chemicals are disposed of carelessly. Carelessly disposed of materials can enter the water table, find their way into streams, rivers and lakes, where they kill or poison fish and other creatures that live in water. The other environmental hazard in the GHS is our ozone layer. This is a layer of gas made up of three atoms of oxygen. It surrounds the Earth in our atmosphere and filters out some of the harmful rays of the sun, protecting us somewhat from the sunburn or skin cancer. Given that the GHS focuses on just two types of environmental hazard, this section of our program is rather short. But it's an appropriate point to introduce the next few sections of our program which are about preventing hazards from happening, because at the end of the day, no hazards need happen. And one of the principal ways we can prevent hazards from happening is by using safety, health and environmental management systems, sometimes called SHE, or SHE management systems. These SHE management systems go under a number of names. Sometimes they're called voluntary protection programs, sometimes they're called loss control programs, but whatever they're called, most try to do one key thing, and that is to embed safe procedures in the way each job is done, on the shop floor, in the hospital, in the laboratory, and yes, even in the office. Organizations that have introduced chi management programs have noted huge benefits because the way we do a job safely is, in the long run, the most efficient and effective way to do it. So not only do she management programs keep people, property and process free from harm, they improve productivity, reduce lost time accidents and boost corporate morale. Sounds like all workplaces should have some form of she management, doesn't it? Now, oddly enough, even though she management programs have proved their worth time and time again, there are still organizations reluctant to introduce them because they think they're too expensive. Safety systems? Too expensive? If you think safety's expensive, try paying for the cost of a serious accident. Now that's expensive. So remember, a simple get-you-started she management program doesn't cost that much, and the difference it can make to corporate morale and efficiency is amazing. Now just to quickly summarize section four. Environmental hazards are those that damage the aquatic life or those that damage the ozone layer. We can prevent all kinds of hazards from happening by introducing safety, health, and environmental she management systems. Ah. It's time for the quiz. Just a few questions on the quiz in section four. See you when you're ready for section five, where we have some good examples of how we can prevent hazards from happening. In this training program, I included three sections on how to prevent hazards from happening. Because to my mind, there's little point in teaching people how to identify hazards if you don't give them some ideas on how to avoid them. In the next three sections, we're going to take each of the main hazard groups from the GHS and give some examples of how to prevent them from happening. When we finish section five, we'll be able to give three examples of how physical hazards can be prevented, explain what a job hazard analysis is, and explain what a root cause analysis is in accident investigation. A SHE management program is a really good way to prevent physical hazards from happening. The aim in SHE management is to build safety into all aspects of the day-to-day -day work. A good place to start is to get people involved by asking them what they do and how they could do it more safely. The ideas and know-how of the experienced worker doing the job is knowledge we need to make our workplaces safer. In our next slide, 
is an example of a she management approach called a job hazard analysis or JHA. A job hazard analysis or JHA is a critical part of a she management program. And the basic idea is to observe how a job is done, then break it down into the step-by-step -step tasks required to take it from start to finish. Then we study each of these steps and ask ourselves, is this the safest way of doing it? Are we using the right kinds of protective equipment? Is the ventilation in the right place in relation to where the worker is standing? And once we've analyzed the whole job from the first step to the last, we can introduce measures to improve the way the job is done and make it safer. In the long run, making a job safer almost invariably makes it more productive. In slide 46 is another example of something that we find in a she management program. That is, training people to use Standard Operating Procedures, or SOPs. SOPs are steps we must always take in a certain order to do certain types of work. Standard Operating Procedures often require us to post reminders about which protective equipment should be worn before starting work in certain areas. Here's another example of a critical part of a she management program that can prevent serious physical hazards from happening. In the slide, a drum has fallen off the back of a small truck. Now, fortunately, when this drum fell off, nobody was hurt, but it was a close call. It could have fallen onto somebody and it could have splashed people with toxic or corrosive chemicals. It didn't. But let's do an investigation of this incident to find out the root cause of the problem and make sure it doesn't happen again. In this case, the immediate cause of the accident was that the drum fell off the back of the truck because the tailgate fell open as the truck moved away. OK, so now let's dig a little deeper and ask, why did the tailgate fall open? Well, further investigations showed that the bolts on the tailgate had rusted out to the point where they were very fragile, and with the acceleration of the truck pushing the drum against the tailgate, the bolts snapped, causing the tailgate to drop and the drum to fall out. OK, so we've dug a little deeper now, and we've found that the problem was the bolts rusted out. Was that the root cause? No, we're not there yet. Now we have to ask ourselves, why did those tailgate bolts rust out? And the answer is that nobody ever checked them or maintained them. It was nobody's job to go and look at those bolts to make sure they were safe and fully operational. So the root cause of this problem was a management failure to maintain the tailgate bolts. And the solution to make sure these drums don't fall off anymore is for the management to make sure somebody is responsible for maintaining and replacing those bolts when they are worn. Hmm. So let's give the job to Stanislav Kowalski. He's a great maintenance guy. He'll take care of the problem. Terrific. Problem solved. No more drums crashing to the floor. Ah, but wait, we're not quite there yet. You see, there's an old management adage that says, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So in the interests of safety, we have to make Stan's check of the tailgate bolts something we can measure. We can do that by asking Stan if he could complete this task on the first week of every month and then go to the shop floor office and write a quick note on a record sheet of what he did and when. That way, when Stan takes a holiday or gets sick or is reassigned to another job, we have a red flag raised in the office to tell us that the tailgate maintenance must be done by someone else while Stan is away. This is how she management works. And you'll probably realize that by making sure we can measure the work that needs to be done for safety, we're also improving efficiency and productivity at the same time. We've finished section five, so let's recap. We covered three examples of she management that prevent physical hazards from happening. One example was a job hazard analysis. Another was using standard operating procedures. 
and a third example was how to conduct a root cause analysis. All of these examples form a part of a good safety, health, and environmental management system for your workplace. I think it's time to break for the quiz. I'll see you back in section six. In section six, we're going to look at how we can prevent health hazards from happening. There's an awful lot of misinformation about how chemicals can harm our health. This section helps us understand the issues and concerns much better. After completing section six, we will be able to explain the difference between hazard and risk, name two main strategies to reduce and prevent exposure, name the two main ways workplace chemicals enter the body, give three examples of a safe person approach, and give three examples of a safe place approach. Let's start with the good news that no health hazards need happen. Chemicals can't cause harm or health effects if they don't contact or enter the body. At the bottom of this slide, we see an equation. The risk of a health effect is equal to the hazard times the exposure. In other words, the chemical must be hazardous and we must be exposed to it before we risk having a health effect. So if we avoid being exposed, the risk of a health effect is zero. Zero exposure times the hazard equals zero risk. The employee in this slide is wearing the right protective equipment because he understands that if he's not exposed, his risk is zero. Let's have a look at this business of hazard and risk a little more closely in slide 50. Hazard and risk are not the same. The bullets in the slide are a high hazard, but they present no risk just sitting on a table. We are not exposed to the bullets in a form that is risky. The bull, on the other hand, is quite a different story. Roaming free, angry, and in our face, he's not just a hazard, but a serious risk. He could gore us with those horns right here, right now. The bullets, they can't harm us, not in that form. And there's an important concept here. In the workplace, we often worry about chemicals that have a high hazard, but in reality, the way we use them can make the risk very small. Let's look at this in a workplace situation in slide 51. Here we have three situations. On the left, we have a drum of a toxic material and it's completely sealed. In this condition, with it stored correctly and not handled, there's no exposure to the chemical inside the drum. It can't get out. It's still a high hazard, but the risk is zero because nobody is exposed to it. Let's look at the next situation in the middle column. The chemical is still stored correctly, but now the seal has been broken and toxic vapors are escaping. There is a worker unprotected, who is standing by the drum and breathing in the vapors. So the exposure in this instance is high, the hazard is high, and the risk is high because the worker is not protected in any way. Now, how do we prevent the hazard from happening? Well, one way is to wear protective equipment like the worker in the column on the right. He's wearing a respirator which filters out the toxic vapors and prevents him from inhaling them. So the hazard is high, but the risk is low because the exposure is low. Here is the key then. If we can avoid exposure to the chemical no matter how hazardous it is, then the risk is low. So if we know the ways in which we are exposed, we can prevent the exposure and reduce the risk. Slide 52 shows four ways workplace chemicals can enter the body and therefore cause us to be exposed. If we can prevent the chemicals from entering by these routes, we prevent exposure and reduce our risk. In the workplace, there are two main ways chemicals enter our bodies. The first and most common way is by breathing in contaminated workplace air. The second way is by contacting chemicals on the skin because some chemicals can actually pass through the skin. Other, usually very minor ways, 
are by eating contaminated food and possibly by eye contact. Let's have a look at each of these routes in turn and see how we can prevent exposure. In slide 53, we can see that chemicals entering the airways are drawn into the lungs where they can cross into the bloodstream. Other chemicals that can't cross, such as dusts and fibers, accumulate in the lungs and can cause damage over a number of years. Other chemicals still may just cause local effects, such as irritation of the nose and throat. Slide 54 shows we can put controls on the workplace to prevent breathing in contaminated air. The top three illustrations show three different types of ventilation systems that draw contaminated air out of the workplace and exhaust it safely. The ventilation must take account of the way the work is done. It is pointless having a ventilation system like the one at the bottom right if the worker has to lean into the vapors. The system at the bottom left is much better. The vapors are drawn away from the worker. Slide 55 shows another approach to prevent workplace exposure to vapors. In this approach, the focus is on the person, not on the workplace. We can provide people with various types of masks and respirators that stop them from being exposed and therefore reduce the hazard. On the left, we have a mask that is good for dusts. It removes particles from the air, but will not protect anybody from vapors. In the middle, wearing a cartridge air purifying respirator, which is good for protection from light vapors. On the right, wearing self-contained breathing equipment that provides maximum protection against high vapor concentrations. Now let's look at the second major route by which chemicals enter the body, and that is through the skin. Some chemicals can get into our bloodstream by dissolving the oils and fats in our skin. Once again, blocking this route of entry can be achieved by using controls on the workplace or by using personal protective equipment. Protecting the skin from splashes of chemicals doesn't have to involve great expense or sophistication. It can be a simple matter of she management, such as putting splash guards around open containers or by ensuring that drums of containers are stored securely so they don't tip, fall over, break and splash. In slide 58, there are other examples of workplace controls. Workplaces can provide showers and laundry facilities so that chemicals are removed and not carried home on the body or in clothing. Also, good housekeeping goes a long way to making sure a workplace is free of chemical contamination. Slide 59 shows how we can prevent exposure through the skin by using barrier creams, wearing gloves, aprons and boots. Barrier creams and oils help the skin resist penetration by some chemicals, but they are not effective for very long. Gloves, boots and aprons can prevent skin contact, but they must be made of a material that resists the specific chemical we're working with. A much less common way for workplace chemicals to enter the body is by eating contaminated food. Eating and smoking should always be discouraged in areas of the workplace using chemicals. The best idea is to provide washrooms and lunchrooms that are kept completely separate from any area of the workplace and make sure none of those workplace chemicals are stored in the lunchroom fridge. You'd be amazed how often that happens, particularly in workplaces where you'd least expect it. Eye contact is a very minor route of entry for workplace chemicals. Most of the effects on the eye will be local, right at the point where the chemical touches the eye and causes burning or stinging or severe eye damage. Very rarely, if ever, will enough chemical enter the eye to cause poisoning. Slide 63 shows three kinds of eye protection. We must be sure to pick the one recommended for the chemical we're using and the type of work we do. So slide 64 is a summary slide. It shows a work situation where the work process producing vapors is on the left. That's the green area. The air path where the vapors drift is in the middle. That's the blue area. And the location of the worker breathing the vapors is on the right. That's the orange area. The slide shows there are two main strategies to prevent and reduce exposure and therefore minimize the risk of a health hazard. These two strategies are called safe place and safe person. 
Safe place strategies are those placed at the source of the chemical vapors or in the air path. The best safe place controls are those directly at the source, such as local ventilation that removes vapors as they are produced and doesn't allow them into the air path. We can also reduce the hazard at the source by changing the production method to reduce vapor emissions or by substituting with a less toxic chemical that will do the job. And as a final example of a control at the source, we can enclose and isolate the whole process. These are all safe place strategies at the source of the hazard. Now we can move away from the hazard source and into the air path where we can put general ventilation, such as a big ceiling fan that extracts the air up and out of the building. We can also increase the distance between the source of the vapors and the worker because as we increase the distance, we increase the dilution and the vapors become less harmful. Now at the worker's location, we can use safe person strategies by wearing all kinds of personal protective equipment. Dust masks or vapor masks or self-contained breathing apparatus, whatever is required. We can also change the job schedule so that the worker is only working in a high exposure area for a short period of time. Alternatively, we can put the worker in an enclosure so that he or she is not exposed to the chemical from the source at all. Now, in an ideal world, the best place to put the controls is at the source of the vapors because if we do that, we are reducing the hazard at the point where it is being created. Using personal protective equipment protects the worker but does nothing to reduce the hazard. However, sometimes the nature of the work means we have no other option but to use personal protective equipment. So in summary, when it comes to health hazards, there's a difference between hazard and risk. And if we prevent exposure, we eliminate or reduce the risk. The two main routes of exposure are breathing contaminated workplace air and skin contact. If we can block exposure at these routes, we greatly reduce the risk of any health effect. There are two main strategies for preventing exposure, safe place and safe person. Ooh, that was a long section. We all deserve a break. Try the quiz and I'll see you back in section seven, which incidentally is very short. See you soon. In section seven, we're going to finish up looking at how to prevent hazards from happening, and this time focusing on environmental hazards. When we finish this section, we'll be able to describe one example of a way to prevent pollution of the aquatic environment and explain the what-if approach to preventing environmental hazards. There are several different ways a SHE management system uses to treat contaminated water and minimize water pollution. There are also ways that SHE management can prevent damage to the ozone layer for example, by substituting harmful chemicals with less harmful ones. Here's an example of one way to treat contaminated water. Where large quantities of wastewater are produced, a company may choose to use settling ponds, which allow the contaminants in the water to settle to the bottom. For most organizations, disposal of chemicals must comply with local and national environmental regulations and often requires handing the waste to a company specializing in chemical waste treatment and safe disposal. A second example to prevent water contamination is by safe engineering design. This means that when we create a manufacturing product line, we look at the complete workflow step by step and ask, what if something were to go wrong, such as a valve were to blow, a switch was to fail, a cargo was to spill and so on. And then coming up with solutions such as ditches and dikes for spill containment and storm water overflow, and making sure there's no direct exit from a spill into a sewer. Another method would be to conduct preventive maintenance on equipment so that if it fails, it does so in a safe mode, 
So now we know about the three main groups of hazards in the GHS, and those are physical, health, and environmental. And we also have some examples of how we can prevent these various hazards from happening using chi management approaches. The final and most important thing we need to know is how to recognize which materials have physical, health, or environmental hazards. The globally harmonized system does this in two main ways. It uses labels and safety data sheets. Time for a quick review of Section 7. We mentioned water settling ponds to reduce pollution. We covered a preventive technique called the what-if approach. And we finished up by noting the two main ways, labels and safety data sheets, that are used by the globally harmonized system to tell us about hazards. Have a shot at the quiz at the end of Section 7 and see how you do. And in Section 8, we'll take a good, hard look at the supplier labels used in the globally harmonized system. Now we know the types of hazards we are dealing with, we can move on to Section 8 and see how the GHS helps us identify those hazards. In Section 8, we're going to take a look at what a chemical supplier's label looks like. When we are done with Section 8, we will be able to correctly identify the nine symbols in the GHS, explain the meaning of the signal words danger and warning, explain the purpose of the hazard and precautionary statements, name the parts required on a supplier label, and know some of the alternatives and options for label information. Here are some of the symbols for physical hazards. All the symbols in the GHS will be black on a white background within a red diamond-shaped border. This is required for all shipments leaving one country and going to another. For shipments internally within a country, the GHS allows regulatory agencies to permit the diamond border to be black. All of this will, of course, depend upon what the regulatory agency in your country decides. As for the pictures, or pictograms, the top picture is called the exploding bomb and indicates explosive materials. The flame indicates flammable materials that burst into flames easily, and the flame over circle indicates oxidizing materials. There are two more physical hazard symbols. The one at the top of this slide is called corrosion and warns of corrosive materials. The symbol at the bottom is called gas cylinder and warns of gases under pressure. Here we have some of the symbols for health hazards. The skull and crossbones warn of chemicals which are acutely toxic that is to say, exposure can cause immediate and serious health effects. Underneath, we have a corrosion symbol, indicating that if the material touches your skin or eyes, it's going to cause chemical burns. The exclamation mark is used as a symbol for a variety of immediate health hazards, such as a skin rash or difficulty breathing. Generally, these hazards are considered less serious than those denoted by the skull and crossbones. Reference to the hazard statement and safety data sheet may be needed to determine the exact type of health hazard posed by chemicals with the exclamation symbol. The symbol at the bottom is called health hazard, but often it's known as the star man for obvious reasons. And for the most part, it indicates chemicals that may cause long-term health hazards from repeated day-after-day -day exposure for many months or years. But there are instances where the star man can denote other types of health hazards. Always look at the hazard statements and safety data sheets to find out exactly what the health hazard is. Slide 75 shows the two symbols used to denote environmental hazards. The dead tree and fish indicates chemicals hazardous to the aquatic environment, and this hazard can be short or long term. Also, the GHS decided to use the exclamation mark to indicate chemicals damaging the ozone layer. The symbol was chosen because the damage to the ozone layer might in turn lead to health problems in people exposed to harmful rays of the sun. Aside from the pictogram symbols, the GHS labels will have words known as signal words. 
The GHS uses signal words to indicate the degree or extent of the hazard. There are two signal words. One is the word danger, which is present on containers of chemicals with serious hazards. The other is the word warning, which is present on the containers of less serious hazards. Note that the word caution is not used in the GHS. Also found on the label are hazard statements, which sometimes tell us about the situation in which the hazard might happen and give us more details about the hazard, and precautionary statements, which tell us how to avoid the hazards. So, information on the label helps us answer three important questions. What is the hazard? And we find that out by looking at the pictogram. Is the hazard serious? And we find that out by reading the signal word danger or warning. And what exactly is the hazard? And for that, we read both the hazard and precautionary statements. So for the next few slides, I want to show you some examples of the kinds of information we'll find on labels for various hazardous materials, because the GHS not only tells us what the hazard is, but attempts to tell us the degree of hazard. Is it serious or is it less serious? So the GHS identifies each main hazard class by the nine pictograms. Then it divides these main classes into subgroups called categories, according to whether they are serious or less serious hazards. Let's have a look at some of these. Slide 78 gives examples of the kind of information found on packaging of materials classed as explosive. Each of the four white columns represents the kind of information we might find on containers of different explosive materials. So the most serious hazard is that on the far left, headed unstable. While the materials become slightly less hazardous as we move to the right, they all still carry the signal word danger and all are serious hazards. Let's have a look at slide 79, which deals with materials classed as flammable liquids. Each of the white columns shows different categories of flammable liquids. On the left, we see that the flammable liquid has the signal word danger, and the hazard statement indicates it is extremely flammable, as a liquid and a vapor. The next one to it, on the right, is quite hazardous too. It is highly flammable in both liquid and vapor forms. However, in the third column, we notice that the signal word is warning, not danger, so this is an indication that the hazard is less serious. And when we read the hazard statement, it states only that it is a flammable liquid and vapor. It is neither extremely nor highly flammable. Note that in the last column, there's no flame symbol, only a signal word warning, and the hazard statement indicating it is a combustible liquid. In other words, it doesn't catch fire easily but will only burn if a consistent source of heat is directed at it for some time. Corrosive materials are easy to understand. They will generally all have the signal word danger or warning, and the statement about their corrosiveness, just as shown in the slide. This particular material is corrosive to metals. Slide 81 shows three categories of oxidizing materials and the information we might find on a container of each. The most hazardous oxidizers will have the signal word danger and the hazard statement may cause explosions. The least hazardous oxidizers will have the signal word warning and the hazard statement can intensify a fire. Gases under pressure will be indicated on the label as compressed gases, liquefied gases, refrigerated liquefied gases, or dissolved gases. Almost all compressed gases will have the signal word warning and the hazard statement will indicate exactly what the hazard is. A variety of symbols may indicate health effects where the chemical acts directly on parts of the body. Note the danger signal word underneath the corrosion symbol at the top left column indicating corrosion of body tissue and the exclamation mark next to it for skin irritation and allergies. Note in that top right column there will be no symbol where there is mild skin irritation, 
only a warning signal word and a hazard statement. The star man is not just used for chronic poisoning. It will also be seen in situations where inhaling vapors can cause asthma or allergy and local effects on the airways. This slide indicates the type of symbols for materials that are acutely toxic. As a general rule, the skull and crossbones is found on those materials showing a greater acute toxicity than those with the exclamation mark. Note in this instance the hazard statement on the label will indicate the route by which the poisoning occurs, by mouth, through the skin, or by breathing in. Here we see an example of the Starman symbol used to warn of chronic or long-term poisoning. In some instances where repeated day-after-day -day exposure can cause chronic respiratory irritation, an exclamation mark is used, even though, for the most part, the exclamation mark warns of immediate toxic effects. This underlines the importance of reading the hazard statements on the label and safety data sheet and making sure we know exactly what the hazard is. The dead tree and fish symbol indicates materials that can immediately damage the aquatic environment. Sometimes there will just be a hazard statement without a signal word or a symbol. Chemicals that might damage the ozone layer will have an exclamation mark. Materials which can cause long-term damage to the environment will also be identified by the dead tree and fish, but the hazard statement will indicate that the effects are long-lasting. So here's a summary page. Physical hazards are flammable and or reactive chemicals that cause physical damage to people, property, and process. Health hazards are those which can harm human health. Environmental hazards are those which can damage the ozone layer or harm wildlife in rivers and lakes. Now the three questions we have to ask when we read a label are as follows. What is the hazard? And we know that from looking at the picture symbol. Is the hazard serious? We read the signal word. Danger means serious. Warning means less serious. And then we go to find out exactly what the hazard is by reading the hazard statement. Armed with this information, we can then take the necessary precautions to avoid the hazard. This slide gives us a summary of the pictograms. There are five of them along the top that denote physical hazards. Health hazards are the four in the middle row, and environmental hazards are the two at the bottom. Some of the symbols, such as the exclamation mark and the corrosive symbol, denote hazards in more than one group. While the purpose of the GHS is to make sure that information on labels and safety data sheets is basically the same all over the world, there will still be minor variances from country to country. For example, the symbol we see here will be used in some countries to denote biological hazards. It is not an official GHS symbol, since it doesn't relate to chemical hazards. It will be used where there are germs, viruses, or other infectious materials. Some, but not all countries, may choose to use this symbol. Now let's start to put all these parts together and see what a chemical supplier's label will look like. And again, there might be variations from country to country, but this is basically what it is. The name of the material would be present, and that is known as the product identifier. Degreaser line is, of course, not a proper chemical name. It is what is known as a trade name or a commercial name made up to market the product. Signal words and pictograms will be present. Hazard and precautionary statements will be there. Basic first aid information will be a part of the precautionary statements. And most important, the address and contact information for the chemical supplier will be clearly noted. Now, as I mentioned, there may be minor variations on the label from country to country. Some countries, for example, may put a bright border around the supplier label so that it stands out from other information. And in some countries, it may be permissible to use pictograms instead of words to denote the kinds of precautions needed to protect against the hazards. Countries in the European Union may, in some cases, require information on the weight of the contents in the container, while other countries may insist on listing the actual hazardous ingredients on the label and not just the trade name. 
So we've succeeded in harmonizing the big and important items on the hazard warning label, but a few little details might be different from country to country. For example, in the big issues, we've managed to harmonize supplier label symbols with those used for the transportation of dangerous goods, and that's a huge step forward. And it means that in some countries, it may not be necessary to duplicate a symbol on a supplier label if it's already on the drum for transportation purposes. For example, in the slide above, the flammable symbol appears on the transport label, but not on the supplier label. But regulatory agencies may differ in their interpretation of what pictures should appear on the label in these situations. So now we know how the GHS uses the supplier label as the first line of defense against chemical hazards. It's a really good system. It uses pictograms to tell us the main hazard classes, signal words to tell us how hazardous they are, hazard statements to tell us the exact type of hazard, and precautionary statements to tell us how to avoid the hazard. This is a terrific improvement over most previous systems. OK, we've reached the end of Section 8. See how much of this you can remember by trying the quiz. Match up those nine symbols with their names and what they mean. There are only two sections left in our GHS training program. Both of them are quite short. Hang in there, and I'll see you in Section 9. Welcome back. Section 9 is really the shortest section in the entire program, and I hope that makes up for the last section being rather long. This section consists only of three slides because it's basically about labels used in-house by your company and is the spot in your program where your safety staff may choose to review the in-house systems. Now, the GHS doesn't indicate exactly what in-house labels should look like, but your regulatory authority in your country or jurisdiction will undoubtedly provide some guidelines. When we finish this section, we'll be able to describe what information should appear on an in-house label and explain any alternatives that may be allowed. The question everyone asks is, what information should appear on an in-house label and what alternatives are allowed? But because what is allowed differs from country to country, we have to generalize a bit here. When the contents of a large drum coming from the chemical supplier are broken down into smaller containers, essential hazard and protective measures must be present on the in-house label. This usually consists of including the name of the product, such as degreaser line, sometimes, but not always, the name of the supplier or manufacturer, signal words will be present, precautionary measures, and the hazard symbols. These are usually the basic parts of information that go onto an in-house label. Now, your regulatory jurisdiction may determine and decide that other information has to go on these in-house labels. As well, your company as a matter of policy may decide that it needs more details. Slide 96 indicates one alternative actually mentioned in the GHS. And that is, instead of putting tiny labels that may be unreadable on small containers, it might be allowable to put a large placard in an area where the same chemical is used repeatedly day after day. In many ways, this might be a better option for some types of work. The hazard information is displayed on a large, clear placard on the wall and isn't hidden in tiny print on a small container. This is, of course, something that you're going to have to check out with your regulatory agency and with your company policies. You'll be pleased to know there's no quiz for this section on in-house labels. Just be certain that you know and understand the system that your company uses, if indeed it has an in-house labeling system. Section 10 is the very last section of our training program for the GHS it deals with the information we find on a safety data sheet. This part of the program is designed for you to work in groups. The trainer leading the class should distribute several different SDSs used in your company that you may have to work with. As they hand the SDS to your group, 
they should say, your group will work with super solvent ABC. For the next group, you'll be working with Wonder Cleaner X, and so on, so that each group is reading a different SDS of a material used in your workplace. Listen carefully to the name of the material when the trainer hands out the SDS. You will need to remember it later. Now, if you don't have a data sheet provided by your company, there's an example of one at the back of the student notebook. And if you're taking this program by yourself online, there'll be an SDS for you to look at on the screen after the Section 10 slides. When we've finished Section 10, we'll be able to check the identity of the chemical we are using, locate the hazard symbols and identify the hazard, locate the first aid measures, know where to find important handling and storage information, know where to find information on exposure controls, locate disposal information, and know where to find transport details. One big advantage of the GHS is that all the SDSs now have information listed in the same sequence no matter which country or which part of the world the chemical comes from. There are 16 parts to a GHS safety datasheet, and you'll be relieved to hear this training program isn't going to painfully itemize and review all 16 parts. Rather, we're going to focus on how to use the SDS and find your way around the important information. The purpose of the next few slides is to give you a general orientation to what's on the SDS. Let's have a look at the top two items found on the globally harmonized system SDS. The very first item on the SDS will be the name of the product, either a real chemical name or the trade name given by the supplier, such as degreaserline. Some countries, such as those in the European Union, will give the date the SDS was prepared on the first page, as well as the dates on which any revisions were made. There will also be contact information for the manufacturer and the supplier, as well as any product codes. Always remember, when we are looking at the SDS, we must make sure the name of the chemical on the data sheet is the same as that on the label of the material we are using. That way, we know we have the right data sheet for the chemical we're working with. Directly underneath the name of the chemical are the hazard symbols, where we are going to see the same pictograms or pictogram names that we find on the chemical label. This is most helpful because if the picture is a flame, we can immediately go to section 5, which indicates the firefighting measures. If it's a health hazard, such as the star man, we can go to section 11, which gives us all the toxicological information. Of course, if the hazards were environmental, we could go to section 12, which gives us all the ecological information. Whatever country the SDS comes from, the information will always be in the same section in the same order. We should always look closely at first aid information in section 4 of the SDS and read it ahead of time. Because if there is an accident, such as a splash in the eye, we may need to take swift action. The handling and storage information is found in section 7. We should always check this in case we need to use non-sparking tools or any special storage facilities. Section 8 of the SDS indicates any exposure controls and personal protective equipment required when working with the material. Also in this section, companies may list the exposure limits for the various countries where the product is sold. Now, if ever there is a spill or a need to clean up after using the chemical, always go to section which will give details of how to dispose and clean up waste. For example, it may tell us we have to consult national or local regulations. It may tell us to use a hazardous waste disposal company, and there may be special ways to treat or decontaminate the spill. Or perhaps just water is sufficient for the cleanup. Section 16 of the SDS is a catch-all for all other information about the chemical. Some countries may put the SDS preparation date here and any amendments that were made. It is a good idea to check the last time that the SDS was revised 
because some countries put a time limit on their SDS, usually between three and five years. Even if there's no time limit in your country, but the SDS you're reading is more than five years old, it's a good idea to check if there's anything more recent. So the purpose of the slides in this part of our training program was to give you a general orientation to the GHS safety data sheet. And instead of a quiz, we'll ask you to do some group work and find the information listed on slide 106. Then, if your trainer wishes, each group can tell the rest of the class about what you found on your SDS. Here's what your group will need to do. Firstly, check the identity of the material. Have we got the right safety data sheet? Is the name on the SDS the same as the name the trainer told you when he gave it to your group? Is it up to date? If the data sheet is getting to be several years old, just make sure there isn't a newer one that hasn't replaced the one you're using. In the classroom, we can't actually determine an answer to our next question, but we can at least find the description of the material on the SDS. Is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas? What color is it? Does it have an odor? Next, check the hazard information. Does the material burn, explode, react, or harm our health? Is the hazard serious or less serious? What exactly is the hazard? Are there any details on how it might happen? Now, find out about the protection we need. For protection, we must check out what engineering or special ventilation controls are needed. And do we need any personal protective equipment such as a respirator or gloves? Is any form of special handling needed? And finally, in emergencies, what are we going to do in case of first aid or emergency responses for a spill? Your trainer may ask you to report one or more of these parts to the rest of the class. We are coming to the end of our training program now. Slide 107 summarizes what we need to do to work safely with chemicals. We find out the hazards. Are they physical, health, or environmental? We protect ourselves and our environment from those hazards by reading the supplier label, reading the in-house labels, reading the safety data sheets, and then we act on the information to work safely. So because we finished by locating information on an SDS, there's no quiz for this section. I hope you really enjoyed the program and that it informed you about the key things we need to know in the GHS. The GHS introduces some really important and far-reaching improvements to help us identify hazardous materials. So take care in your work. Read the hazard information and take the precautions needed to make sure that each night you go home safely. Use the globally harmonized system it can make a difference. Goodbye, and work safely.